and so on. And uh, like uh, a bit of my background, I uh, graduated the uh, Warsaw University of Technology, being a part of the Student CubeSat project, uh, working for space education office in Poland, and then a couple of companies, also a little bit uh, leading the company in Luxembourg, and now I'm in Czech Republic. Yeah, hi, I'm Sava Kudamilidis. Um, I'm a patent attorney and commercial lawyer. Um, and I worked mainly with uh, technology companies around um, commercialization. Um, uh, my interest is now at the moment, and I did my thesis on gaps in the patent system for drug development and life sciences. So in particular, um, things like open source medicines where like uh, off patent drugs, diets, supplements, lifestyle interventions, where it's not possible to enforce a monopoly price. And then more recently, um, I'd set up a charity at the time, and then more recently, and uh, pursuing that, it's called Crowdfunded Cures. And we are a DSI project, which is a decentralized science. Um, I've also been advising um, blockchain projects for the last uh, three, through three to four years. Um, but yeah, we're very interested in the idea of uh, programmable money and uh, solving um, market failures under the current uh, markets and um, and also sort of setting up new economies and new ways of, of, of essentially creating a generative um, and additive economies that sort of address market failures um, and I think that would help drive science forward. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, I am Ray Bunga, I'm PhD in robotics. I I, um, I have a, a company now, it's a startup, I'm CEO of Parametry.ai. We're doing, uh, the, the, first, the first goal of the company was to do uh, health monitoring for spacecraft, but I got an amazing partnership with the University of Strathclyde. We are actually decentralizing what's happening in orbit in order to avoid geopolitical uh, problems in you know, um, interacting in orbit. So this is a, this is a complex challenge. There, there are a lot of uh, uh, different uh, aspects to that. Uh, I worked all my life in uh, satellite imagery uh, until I came to, uh, to the backstage of it uh, in, uh, in ESA, in space operations, where I did data science there. So I have some kind of background of a bit of everything. And, uh, and then I worked uh, three years at the European Central Bank, so also like quite um, impacted by the governance ap aspect of things. And I love what I'm doing on decentralizing things. This should not belong to our company. This is something that we want everybody to use to interact, but this should not, should not be honored by us. So um, this is called Space DAO, and, uh, and, um, and I, I wish to talk about that a bit more later. Yeah, yeah now we can go now to the, well, di di directly to the moon, and later we'll talk about medical side of all kinds of projects. So Dorian. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, um, thank you for inviting me to the panel. My name is Dorian Ledger. Um, I'm working with iSpace for a little under a year now, and my role in iSpace is in uh, business tech partnerships. So what that means is I'm sort of a bridge between the business teams and the engineering teams. Um, and uh, my background, I started off studying economics, um, got a degree in economics, worked in uh, finance, automotive industry for a little while, um, and then decided to study life sciences. Um, so I moved to Germany and um, I studied molecular ecology and ended up working in a few different labs in the life sciences domain. Um, and at the same time, I was always very interested in, in space. So I collaborated a lot with the European Space Agency. Um, and in particular, I worked on a project to calculate the energy requirements of producing oxygen on the moon by considering the, the whole value chain of oxygen production. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Right, and Ilaria, now it's time for this well medical part, the whole ecosystem. <laughs> I think you've done my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to uh, thank you so much for, for the invitation. Thanks to Albert and Chris for uh, moderating the panel. Uh, my name is Ilaria Snelli. I am a biomedical engineer and, uh, with a bachelor, master, PhD, postdoc in, uh, um, in engineering. I am specialized in uh, um, computational modeling, um, but however, I also am very passionate about space medicine and I had my leader experience in the field. I am a fellow of the Aerospace Medical Association and a fellow of the Aerospace Human Factors Association. 
I work full time for a company uh, that's called ICO. We are in Italy, in Turin. Uh, we are specialized in artificial intelligence techniques uh, for uh, increasing space mission autonomy. And we do mainly work on uncrewed mission, meaning, meaning that we work on assets uh, such as satellites. But we are also considering expanding to rovers and healthcare. <laughs> uh, well, that's, that's the fun part, I guess, of the work. Great, thanks. So now I think that, well, we can start with defining how we can talk about, well, deep technology economy and also the space economy, as we talked about very futuristic technology in which we need a lot of uh, development. And Inna, from your perspective, as you are in this, well, space industry for many years and you were involved in multiple industries, and how does it look uh, from your perspective? Well, so space is already deep tech, so it's easy. <laughs> And then uh, I think uh, what we try to do, I mean, especially last uh, decades, is uh, to downstream space to Earth and everything which we are developing for the, for the reason of using uh, in space, uh, basically to also use uh, on Earth. And uh, what uh, now also I see is, uh, especially with the Moon Mars exploration, we start to think about uh, presence of human in space. So we start to also uh, invest a lot of uh, science and research in all of the kind, biological, psychological aspects, uh, medical aspects. And there is, uh, let's say, I see more and more experiments uh, happening, uh, I mean, the, the need of perform the experiment, biological, nanotechnological experiment in microgravity. Mm -hmm. So now maybe if I could take it over from here. But do you think that the way, the number and the scope of those experiments is still going on in the proper direction? Or is it for potentially physically just limited to some of the small sciences around the uh, space sector? What do you think? We have, uh, because we are developing the laboratory for the Space Rider, where we are inviting uh, basically s scientists to put the experiment and to test it. And uh, we had uh, also the companies from pharmaceutical. And this is like a business. It's, it's not, I mean, okay, it's a part of the science, but they, they don't want only to test it, but they want to use the microgravity during the production of the stuff. Okay, so... Do we think that it might be a trend for the future that we will see a number of rising number of companies that are here down to earth that will think about using space assets as a part of the research, as a part of their science, and potentially will it benefit simply on the also activities down on earth? What do you think? Well, this is a question, Albert. Who do you think should answer yeah, to this I question? I think that red. Exactly. That's what I was thinking about. Well, <laughs> space DAOs. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, now this is this is a great question like um, uh, we see like a democratization of the uh, um, uh, access to space so what does this mean so this means that uh, I can have a little team working on a very uh, uh, fascinating topic in biology but still I can choose where I want to run this uh, and doing that in space is just another kind of service I can reach out to and this is what we're say seeing. So um, we, s we are seeing companies, instead of giving you know, satellite imagery, they're giving you insights. So it's becoming insight as a service. We are seeing, you know, I'm, I'm the organizer, organizer uh, of the open source CubeSat workshop. We're seeing uh, CubeSat, which actually wants to be uh, small biological labs. I guess that rejoins what you were saying. And, and they just want to offer that as a service. And actually for free, uh, for, for people who are doing like open source science. And uh, and I, I see this is uh, this is a growing in number those kind of uh, uh, capabilities. Okay, this sounds interesting, Albert. I would rather on this place m maybe perhaps ask a question to our uh, to our speakers whether the open parts of the activities, first especially when we see um, the interaction, rising interaction with what's in space and what's on the ground could potentially clash with the traditional businesses that we are doing nowadays. Patents, for example, trying to restrict yourself and trying not to make a competitor uh, so easily aware, aware of what's going on. I see that there's a lot of questions. I think you're going to answer. <laughs> Is it? Yes, yeah. 
you as as someone will work yeah, in this well your face just yeah. your face expression was like i know what to, what to answer on that side <laughs> <laughs> no yeah not particularly but i mean I, I i do advise companies and um you know around risks and competition and and intellectual property and um i mean i don't see why uh space should be particularly different but perhaps um with space or with the issues that we need to overcome with space um, and exploring, uh, we, we might need to look at different ways of working or perhaps, um, you know, there's a lot of space treaties and things like that. Um, you know, you can't necessarily, uh, I just found out the other day, you're not allowed to take living organisms um, to the moon. Um, so, you know, th there are regulations that need to be uh, taken into account. Um, and uh, so there'll be different ways of doing business, I think, in space that we need to figure out and maybe uh you know that the stakes could be quite high if we get it wrong um but yeah there's definitely precedence i guess like you know how do we figure out how to explore um antarctica and things like that so um but yeah if, if you were to run a business on antarctica i can i can imagine it's probably quite different um you wouldn't really be selling ice ice blocks or anything I wanted also to add my observations and experience. Um, so when you attend uh, like a scientific conference with the scientific environment, <laughs> they're really open. I mean, I, I love it because they are just sitting there and saying like, look, what kind of problems we have, who knows the answer, how we can solve it. Then you go at the stage of, uh, let's say, commercial uh, space. And uh, it's a bit closed. I mean, you, you have the solutions. You don't want really to open them. Sometimes uh, it's always the border. What do you want to announce? What do you want to keep uh, not announced? Uh, and so on. But still, I, when I compare it to other industries where they really they are closed, I mean, we are cooperating because we know that we cannot go alone. And uh, I think uh, the, the space industry is something in between because we know that we need to talk, we know it, that we need to be open, uh, but still we want to uh, keep some solutions. Uh, as an uh, experience when we were doing our uh, CubeSat project at the university, uh, okay, it's not, it's not a company. Of course, we were designing some solutions, we were developing some solutions which might be commercialized. Uh, afterwards, but we decided to open all of the documentation of the project and it brought uh, a very interesting effect that we were recognized all over the world and there were like people and the teams using our documentation. So basically to open the knowledge that we gathered brought us like uh, the image and uh, so the people were coming and saying, guys, we know you, we know that you are doing stuff, so it's also recognition. Does it even sound that if you are clever, cleverly opening some of your documentation and some of your activities, you start to be in a spotlight, which means that uh, entities around the world will start to use you as a reference or will start contacting you. But if you are clever enough, you should know what kind of secrets you should, you should hide, especially if they're important from a commercial perspective, so that any of your competitors will not do any, any the same, uh, any, uh, will not go follow your path and will not try to, do in, try to exploit your, your, um, your successes on that side. I think that might be a very, very important thing when we look on the, um, on the space sector in general. We see definitely rising competition and there's a question how that competition might, might be beneficial to all of us, especially with the topic of today's, uh, of today's day at, at the European uh, Robert Challenge, which is the moon, where, where, we are, where we are going. Albert, what do you think? What kind of a question would we answer when we combine right. the moon and the competition here? Yeah, I think that, uh, that someone from iSpace can answer this question as iSpace is working directly well on building the business model for lunar missions and also cooperation with multiple companies. That's a pure coincidence that we have such a speaker <laughs> in our audience. <laughs> so uh, the first thing that comes to mind is this uh, proverb, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, so yeah, a lot of the missions that we have uh, to the moon, um, the first ones have an immense amount of cooperation uh, between perhaps unlikely partners in the international arena. Um, just to describe, uh, the, f the first mission is supported by industrial partners, a lot of in Japan, uh, as part of this Hatsuko R program. Um, and then there's also uh, government and commercial payloads aboard uh, the lander that's landing. Um, 
uh, early next year. And um, there's two rovers on that mission. So there's a Japanese uh, space agency rover. There's a United Arab Emirates, um, so the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center rover. And then there's uh, some Canadian cameras and, and computers that are uh, supporting this from the commercial side. And the Canadian companies have received uh, funding from the Canadian Space Agency LEAP program. So uh, it's very much a, a combination of uh, factors of, of sharing of resources that have made the, this kind of mission possible. Oh. Right, and Ilaria, well, how do you see in this perspective also of life science and, well, in, in, in terms of global cooperation, as, well, we talked about a very challenging sector? Um, life science is a challenging sector, and it is very well established on the ground for ground application. And I would consider it an emerging um, sector for what concern uh, space applications. Although R&D and clinical trials on the ISSS are not a new topics, but we are about, um, I think, globally to um, witness the expansion of the healthcare sector in uh, several ways that would not be limited to biological or biotechnological um, R&D tests, uh, regardless on the uh, assets, so uh, CubeSat or Space Rider, but we are going to have more, um, it's not more astronaut, um, it's not a larger um, astronaut corp that I'm referring to, but the variation within the astronaut corp. Uh, ESA is currently recruiting the uh, para-astronaut, so astronaut with a disability, uh, that will fly in space soon, I really hope, and this is when, uh, when the fun begins, um, because you have, uh, you, you know, human beings can offer a scientist a variety and possibility of, stu of studies that hasn't done before, and so it's not just about investigating uh, phenomenal biophysical, phenomenal physical principles at the basis of the human body, it's uh, about investigating human beings. And this is really important because if you think about incoming mission to the moon or even to Mars, there are highly chances of that well training, even the former astronauts, we might likely uh, get injured or it's very likely that their performance will change throughout time during the mission. So the, uh, the importance to have people that rep represent diversity answer the very, and, you know, uh, including are diverse in, uh, in a sense that uh, offer, uh, you know, way more opportunity for scientists to the ground. That said, the competition in this sector is very high, and one of the reasons is because there are very limited resources, if you look at deeply, uh, for what um, several regions of, of the world can offer in support of R&D uh, in life sciences in space. So it's very popular right now, the United States are leading this sector just because of the system of how it is. In Europe, it's kind of limited, although there are opportunities, um, and I have the impression that <laughs> we are trying to make it more concrete as a space sector industry, and this is something that we have to explore. Unfortunately, this sector is not that popular as Earth observation just because we haven't found the way to uh, leverage on this sector as we do in other, you know, in other space sectors. And uh, so, but as previous mentioned, we were, we were saying before, the R company very active in producing the infrastructure, in enabling the process that could be, you know, not just infrastructure, it could be the business process. Or, you know, so, so that would, would lead to open up the sector. However, there are some regulation about using pharmaceutical or using medical devices to test or de develop for space application back to the ground or in space. So the, we, we can't, the, you know, the transfer of technology from the ground to space is not direct, especially for medical technology. And it has to be not direct because we cannot just apply what we do on the ground in space, especially when we are dealing with the individuals. But there, is a, there are a lot of opportunity in these fields that I really look forward to explore with you. So sorry if I, no, no, no. <laughs> I thought it was a little no, bit no. chatty. <laughs> I think it's just fascinating. So cooperation is increasing. And if I have to bet, that is, uh, that is the place where we got to uh, look at in, in, in uh, it's not in the foreseeable future, but in, in the near 
near future. But thing. I need to ask a follow-on question in this particular case. Uh, does it mean that in this particular perspective right now, we might consider ourselves ready for, for long-term flights to the moon or even further to the Mars? Or is it still too early on that side? Oh, thank you for the question. Well, uh, it depends on the mission objectives. Um, so people took part to a mission on the moon and they had very little awareness about the human body adaptation to space, okay? Yeah. Because that was a risk that was willing to, to have yeah. and to accept. Right now, I guess there, are, there is so much awareness about the human body adaptation, possible risks, and we are asking ourselves even ethical questions. And uh, consequently, there is a more structured international collaboration, even from a legal point of view. And so I would not say that it would be successful if we go just tomorrow. Uh, it, it takes a lot of research, especially uh, it, it depends on the outcomes that we want. Do we want to bring people alive <laughs> and to, uh, and to, to uh, well, uh, this, is the th this is the point. Do we want to recover the human body? Or do we accept that there will be uh, changes in the human body that cannot be recovered over time? whenever the person will be back. Because if that is the case, then we can leave tomorrow. But it's for the space agency, it's in very important to bring an astronaut to space and to make sure that the person will, f will be fully recovered of anything that could happen inside the body. Then we need time. We need a period on the ground for recovery, rehabilitation, and so on and so forth. So there is a more technology and more infrastructure to produce. So in a way, yes, we could be ready and I would be really happy to be, <laughs> to be, to be used uh, for a use case. I mean, that's fine, you know, people get accepted. I wouldn't mind. Uh, but we have to start somewhere, you know? Of course. So <laughs> and so we are not ready, but in case a space agency or the commercial entity will be happy to accept the risk, then we, we, okay. we are. I'm just um, seeing this as a huge, very wide range of the way we are right now accepting and not accepting risk when it comes to space sector. When, if we talk about a machine, a rover, a satellite, or a lander, anything that uh, doesn't require human presence that place, we can launch multiple units. And if they fail, it's OK, no problem. We'll still learn something. But whenever there's a question about human presence, about the crew that will fly somewhere, the risk has to be limited. And there's a question, what can we do? How, how we are ready on that side? Oh, yeah. if you think that you, <laughs> unless there's a. <laughs> yeah, Dorian. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think, you know, for lander missions also, there's a risk tolerance that is yeah. uh, required uh, that has to be calculated. Um, you know, in our early missions, we're trying to absolutely minimize the risk by simplifying the mission concept yeah. of operations. And um, when someone suggests a new idea of what the rover could do, yeah. uh, there's usually someone in the room that says that's but that's too complicated, <laughs> and uh, that's a good way to ensure the success of the mission is keeping it very simple. Yeah, I think that this is another thing that we have we can consider that sometimes increments when it comes to risk and then um, starting from something simple might be the key in some of the exploratory missions and also might be the key in understanding what kind of technology could be used in that place and which one might not be used. Oh, there's, a <laughs> there's already a comment there. Uh, I got an interesting question yesterday, uh, which was, you know, we're, we're in a robotic challenge right now. Uh, the question was, uh, do you think that some of the components that the teams are doing there um, are are going to go on the moon or on Mars? It was a challenging question because uh, if I say no, I'm like a naysayer. You shouldn't uh, say so. So uh, I think uh, what they're doing is super interesting in terms of concepts. So I guess the concepts or designs could be reused and then, uh, and then the execution of that is different. Uh, I guess what was brought earlier, uh, you know, competition but also collaboration, I think this is a competition so they are like thrilled to do better and uh, because there is a competition uh, in front. You know, in the past, you had like one big uh, player which was uh, awarded a contract. So the competition was on making a documentation. So they everybody got very good at making documentation. So <laughs> because that's the competition yeah. part. And then you have a project. Then you have delays. Then you have things. Then you know have risk aversion, etc. So, uh, but I, th I think things are turning into uh, Earth observation. We've seen that uh, ESA injected a lot of data. So when you have offer and demand, you know how to make your offer because you have the data. Uh, 
that's super important. In medicine, you have also like uh, pools of data here and there. Uh, I, I don't know how organized it is, but uh, <laughs> I, I think I think this is the the core of it. You know, like if you want to make an offer uh, as a business, uh, you need uh, you need the you need the seed in the beginning. Okay, this is super interesting, and then. We have a kind of an overview of what's happening right now. Maybe with a little bit of words about what might be happening in the future. But if we could, let's say, find ourselves right now and speaking about the state of the industry uh, five or ten years from now, what do you think would be the major player? What would be the major drive, if I may say, to that that should be changed uh, since it's, um, in respect to what's happening right now? Yeah, and I think that uh, Sava, you can also share with us your opinion about well mitigating risks in terms of the research and also how we can well support development in this area and also well what kind of changes we can expect well i mean generally from a legal perspective yeah you, you you've got to sort of worry about how to allocate risks and minimize risks and 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 have say regulations in place that that ensure that those um risks are are accounted for um me personally, I'm quite interested in actually more on the medical side of things and getting people healthy and well and making sure that, you know, if they do go into space and things or, or, or you know, any kind of um, risky behaviour that they're, that they're kept safe. But, um, I, but I'm very interested in the area of, of open source uh, medicine and um, I think there's a lot of potential there and I'm hoping that in the next sort of five or ten years, we can start to implement business models around um, open source medicine, um, which I'm happy to talk about later. But um, uh, and one of the main reasons behind that is that um, if you uh, a lot of uh, therapies um, that uh, are essentially open source, like off patent drugs and supplements and diets and 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 just interventions like exercise, lifestyle interventions. These things are all inherently safer than um, new drugs and new molecules, which we don't know what they might do to the body. Um, so personally, I think that's a really promising area um, to try and push towards and also to create um, uh, basically private incentives to do the open source medicine and get private companies working on this and working together versus having it publicly funded, and which is more centralized and there's a lot of we see that in space, controversially, um, that say Elon Musk has done a lot better in a lot of things than say NASA has done. And you know, I remember seeing on the paper that NASA spent like a billion dollars or something on their spacesuit. Um, and you know, it's just an example of where you have very centralized organizations and they might be receiving grants from a government body and there's no sort of fast fail, there's no Darwinian kind of process of actually um, failing quickly um, and th I think I would like to see the markets actually involved in space but also preserving um, open source business models. It, but is it possible as a follow-on question, do you think it's possible that within the next five or ten years uh, such markets or such drive to the market would happen? Um, well I think you can generate if the government kind of comes on board and, and acts as as a supporter and as basically a final purchaser of of things, but lets the markets basically compete and, and do it. It's really up to up to government, I think, ultimately. But I'm also quite hopeful um, about crypto and its ability to basically be a driver for a lot of this innovation because essentially it's it's programmable money and and it gives people access to a lot of liquidity like you can raise hundreds of millions of dollars in like 30 seconds and that hasn't that's a very new thing um but i can't yeah i'm not sure if crypto and space may, I don't, i'm not really the person <laughs> to talk about that but uh, poss okay. possibly maybe that would be well since you opened the pandora's box uh you even opened two pandora's boxes uh, in this particular part case because it started from the word government and you see this as a kind of a drive but then you could potentially, if I understand you right, uh, say a few words about, you, you said a few words about uh, crypto market or crypto activities that could be counterbalanced to, get to, the, to, to the government. Could it be seen like this over the next five or ten years? I mean, just, just on that aspect, I think um, I'm very interested in this idea of impact markets and basically where a government um, 
agrees to purchase uh, impact or public goods, basically. So traditionally, um, governments will fund public goods, like, say, NASA will fund a trip to the moon. Um, but what would be very interesting is that if NASA or a government agency would sort of agree that if you were a private company and flew to the moon, they would reimburse you uh, based on your success. So there would be some sort of criteria for determining what success is. So say the first person to the moon gets, you know, a billion dollars or something like that. Um, and that would be backed by the government and that would create uh, a private incentive to basically get to the moon. And then through the crypto markets, you could then um, potentially allocate capital in a very efficient way um, between multiple stakeholders and have them coordinate um, to, to basically get there. So that, that's an area which I think it would be cool if they did it, um, but uh, it might have to, we might have to wait. Just a short comment to this is how iSpace was created because they, they took a part in an X Prize competition, which uh, was at some point the competition was down, but the company is still there. Yeah, exactly. That was one of the comments I was going to make. So there's this Google Lunar X Prize competition uh, around 2008, yeah. um, and there was a few competitors. No one actually ended up getting to the moon as a result of that competition, which was the the final prize was supposed to be for actually arriving on the moon, driving 500 meters with a rover, and taking a picture and sending it back to Earth. No one could accomplish that because no one could secure a launch to the moon. Um, and of course, this competition fostered so much innovation, though, and basically all the I mean, most of the current um, lunar exploration companies were born out of that competition. And, um, and the fact that no launch provider was able to really take one of the companies up is exactly why, um, like there's also no landers that were able to, 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 to take the mission there, is exactly why iSpace decided to focus on landers as well. So not just rovers, but also make sure that they would have landers to get there by building them themselves. And uh, just another comment um, in terms of the public sector creating sort of uh, crowdsourcing uh, projects, let's say. Um, I think the NASA CLIPS program is a good example of that, right? So there's this commercial lunar payload services program in the United States where NASA is allocating budget to private companies to carry payload to the moon. Um, and that is fostering a lot of competition and uh, yeah, actually, NASA uh, just awarded a $73 million contract to this uh, American consortium called Team Draper, where NASA, oh, sorry, where iSpace yeah. is one of the key um, yeah. players by designing the, the lander that will uh, take NASA's scientific equipment to the far side of the moon. And um, just a, another thought that came to mind, um, so tying it back to life sciences a little bit, you mentioned sort of Darwinian principles uh, helping to create innovation. Uh, I remember in early biology courses, they showed us this matrix of like different relationships that organisms can have. And um, some of those are like predation, so it's always negative for one organism and positive for the other. Symbiosis, it's positive for both. And then there's only one box in the matrix that's negative for both, which is competition, where both are competing for the same resources. But I always thought, actually, no, not really. I mean, if you look at humans, competition is driving us to become better. Um, and I think it's very true in markets, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I had like just, uh, you know, uh, when you said competition, competition or competition, you know, uh, I was thinking of, uh, you know, kids fighting not just to get stronger or to, to get more uh, knowledge of their motricity. motricity. Now I'm, I'm doing AI, it's been a, a long time doing machine learning, and now I'm a young papa, I'm seeing my kid uh, rising up, and uh, is actually a machine to explore, I would say. Uh, and, and I guess uh, some parents don't understand that, so they actually stop their kid before they go exploring because they go out of the bounds that they have themselves. Um, so uh, we try to push them like, to just you know, do your thing so, because they are learning. They are learning many things. You know, like if I ask you like, what's the taste of the, of the ceiling, if you put your tongue on it, you would have an idea, which is weird. 
Like you never did that, but you have an idea because you 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 learn so many things, and then you 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 made a pattern across everything. That's uh, that's a uh, crazy part. So competition competition is, is good, yeah. For both that question would be important about uh, lunar caves, and then what's uh, the what's the compo composition of the roof of the lunar caves of the, of the ceiling of the lunar caves. So definitely exploring, and that curiosity should be important part of us, and uh, we should not stop uh, uh, looking at into each other and then limit ourselves because of, for example, the way we are constru constructed when it comes to competition, for example, and the way technologies are available. Because just because, well, something interesting is just beyond the beyond the corner, which is the topic of our day, the moon. And Albert, uh, asking the question on the, on the side when it comes to the moon and everything that we do uh, around here. Uh, we covered already the current situation. We started briefly talking about the future. Do you think there's any question we should ask about the future? Right, and I think that the most important is about how we can support the development and building, well, the future economy. As well, currently we experiment, like with this Web3, with crypto, and we verify how we can connect this private, public market, and how we can develop, in fact, the new model uh, for uh, supporting research and new projects. So, Ina, would you like to share your opinion about it as well? You were also yes, involved maybe. in as well, <laughs> students' projects. Uh, I can reply a bit in on the mm, previous question about like the past and uh, the future and uh, how, let's say, uh, the space economy, let's say, developing and what we are still lacking. So I think that, uh, um, I, I mean, first of all, like space is a bit slow. We have a lot of inertia. So like five, ten years, it's not the time for us. It's more like 20, 30 years, 50. And uh, I see that uh, for the last, uh, let's say, from let's pick, uh, now it will be 65 years that we are exploring actively. And uh, last 20, 30 years, what we see that uh, it's not, I mean, like the government start to give the contracts to the, uh, to the private companies. But still, uh, I mean, we talk a lot about SpaceX, other companies and so on but still the client is the government. I mean, and this is now, we are good, it's a step forward. We see that it was very beneficial to give uh, uh, basically development to the companies and not to keep it because we see, yes, it works because then we have a lot of companies and we can select the best solution because that's uh, also beneficial for the final, uh, the final product, the final, the, the goal of the mission, the, re the realization of the, of the mission. But still, when you um, when you see the budget, and you pick okay the very expensive projects, who are the client behind the very expensive projects? It's always public money. So we okay we have the companies who are like uh, there is a um, ISI, there is uh, uh, I don't know some some other startups which are like. Uh, uh, not having one client, but uh, selling the satellites for this and that. For Earth observation, we have, I mean, use case that we, we deliver the, the images, the data, and so on. But still, again, who is the final client? It's a government. It's a public money again. So what we need and in the next years, uh, we need to blow up the market a bit the way that, uh, that we have a clients who can pay more and who need it basically okay they can pay we know the people that they can pay a lot of money but they need it that's the thing and i think that for now uh, like uh, a current markets which are developing at the moment in the space industry i would and needs still the business case which is like growing and i think this business case will crystallize once we will be able to demonstrate the technology i would say there are two First one is in orbit servicing, which is still like everyone is talking, we're pushing and so on, but still there is a question mark around the business case. And the second one is ISRU, in situ resources utilization. Again, we are talking, it's I space, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's needed and so on, but still there is like again and again, but really do we I mean, would you pay for it? Or like so that's uh, that's my prognosis. I mean like we, we need this I need it. We need the people who need it and who would pay for it. Yeah, to just uh, to, to follow on, uh, I guess uh, I wanted to, to answer in a way that, uh, to my point of view, uh, the government should be a vector 
for comp for preparing companies to to provide service to other companies. So, to this B two G uh, business to government should should prepare businesses to uh, to commercialize with other businesses. So somehow, like iSpace got supported, you have other companies that got supported. The goal is to go somewhere else. When I was at ISA, every time I had a company there uh, working for ISA, I was telling them, do not uh, plan your company on this project. Like Just just uh, increase your capacities, your skills, your competencies, or uh, your, your offering, but to be ready for the business. But I guess uh, they are still missing this ecosystem uh, uh, creation where you actually have the other businesses in view, you see them, instead of seeing the taxpayers, like, thank you, that was super good. <laughs> Let me yeah. too, you too. <laughs> I think that this is a very, very crucial uh, question on your side. I guess that it differs from the industry to industry, but around there, sooner, sooner or later, there will be someone always from the government. And uh, it might sound as that, um, on one side, the government is, uh, is an, an, an enabler who allows a uh, few of the activities to be done. But on the other hand, we already heard uh, words uh, uh, from you about thousands of documents that have to be done. And there's no competitor. There's only one provider in case of governmental contracts. And there's no, need, there's no true competition. And there's lots of delays on that side. So somewhere there, there's possibly the line for, to improve that could be explored over the next, year, over the next years. Right, and I think it's also quite important to talk about what kind of business model we can apply to it and, well, how do you see future in terms of building the business model and where should be the customers? Should be, well, fully new customers or should we, well, build the presence of some on-earth company, companies directly into space? So I think that is the question to Dorian. Um, so from my perspective, I, I think a lot of Mm, successful space business models will have uh, a space facing and an earth facing uh, aspect component. Um, yes, the government is involved in creating sort of this anchor demand for now, but I mean, it's worth noting that um, iSpace basically survived and went on for a very long time without any contracts from NASA, for example. Um, so it's only very it's only in the few last few months that we got a NASA contract. Everything else has been with um, public uh, sorry with uh, private commercial entities uh, until that point. So it's certainly possible. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the governments are often involved in making very large utilities and very capital intensive projects for for many different um, uh, economic uh, problems that we're trying to solve. So uh, you know, getting to the moon is is one of those. Uh, Artemis is obviously a, a tremendous endeavor, which it would be hard to imagine um, a private company doing alone, but it's also interesting that clearly NASA can't do it alone as well. They're bringing as many partners as possible into this. Um, and yeah, when I think about Artemis, so you know, there's, there's uh, several components. There's the space launch system, that's NASA. There's Orion, that's uh, NASA, but there's also cooperation with the uh, European uh, module um, underneath Orion. Um, Gateway has a lot of private entities that are that are um, collaborating, contributing. HLS is uh, by SpaceX. And um, this whole infrastructure, once built, will help there to be a, a, a network of uh, human transportation to and from the moon. And it will be a big enabler for a lot of the business cases that we're looking at in the in the next few decades. Um, for iSpace, we want to help um, open up the moon to entrepreneurs and to businesses by offering frequent and commercially available transportation. And um, we hope that, you know, I mean, our first mission is launching this year, our second mission in 2024, our third in 2025. So in the next decades, I think that we will build a very robust, um, transportation service around orbitals, um, landers, and rovers. And we envision that we'll have a, we'll contribute to building a moon valley by the year 2040. So 1,000 people living on the moon, uh, 10,000 people coming and going. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, there needs to be a tremendous amount of value chains that are built around yeah. that. So if, if you look at it like an ecosystem, there needs to be so many different uh, blocks working together. Uh, we need water, we need oxygen, we need hydrogen, we need metals, we need launch pads, just to name a few. And there's a lot of business models 
that can be built around all of those. There's not going to be a monopoly of one company doing the whole thing, for sure. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, it's, um, it's very promising that we're going to see so many mm, companies and governments and different organizations coming together to, to make these value chains. But um, I certainly see a role for a lot of private entities to come in and fulfill various blocks of these different value chains. So optimistically, well, I guess we can already see it, but uh, optimistically, sometime in the future, we might see an um, Axiom-style mission to the moon which would be uh, really interesting, not on, only around the moon, but to the moon, and to explore the infrastructure by someone who has not been trained as an astronaut from the beginning, but became a commercial astronaut. Ilaria, do you think that such a thing might happen in over the next, um, over next few years, just after the first landing on the moon? Uh, thank you for the question. <laughs> so it's, uh, it seems a very tricky question. So I've done a recent investigation about the astronaut population, and I've collected a few data, and I'm, uh, the jury is a copyright, and you, you guys do see that open source right now. But the interesting part is that internationally, the uh, most common criteria, and so the reference population, the astronaut reference population across all the world is made by male with, who are veterans with or has military background. And those male are not minority in their home country. And which is very important. Um, and not on the same for the um, co commercial astronauts, okay? So um, most of them have, um, uh, you know, experience of their former astronauts uh, with background, but there is the same things. We are looking for people with military background and uh, who are gonna be a sign of their commercial, commercial activities. Right now, I, I think uh, there are the commercial activities that a uh, commercial astronaut can do in space are sort of limited when they share the same operational scenario and so the same, um, the same spacecraft with former astronauts. And the reason is because there is an, uh, responsibilities in operation and astronauts are in charge of it. So they cannot do whatever they like. Okay. Uh, people can undergo uh, a training as commercial astronauts. Uh, they might have access to facility of the um, space agency, a current facility. However, those are not meant to gas people like in a gym. Okay, there is a process that has to be people. We need to have more fly surgeon in place in space agency for allowing a training the, the, mo the most appropriate training, because what I see right now is that the people are kind of more flexible, if they have the budget to, to let people with a medical history access in space, but at the same time, you have to make sure that their health will be preserved, you know, before flight, during flight, and post-flight, mm -hmm. which is not a straightforward process. We are not there yet. So it's not about budget, it's about human health. And if we do that for astronauts, we don't do that with people who have different criteria, then the, there is a certain discrimination, I must say, about, you know, I dare to say, to, to mention that word. But So it is possible. The thing is that we, we got to make sure and to work on medical standards and what safety look like. So one of the reasons because the International Space Station do not gas people like like I could be, because I have to pick myself, you know, like I am as an average person and so on and so forth, is because of safety, uh, the way in which your safety evolves throughout time, do not include, <laughs> um, includes human in the loops, it is because it has been pushed through the ways, because otherwise, it, uh, but, but, but it, the, the humans in the loop are male with military background. So, and there is a big difference when you want to include women or you want to include a person with a disability. So it's not made for inclusion as we intended on the ground. And so the more, the wider the population, medically speaking, we want them in space, then safety has to evolve. And unfortunately, uh, commercial entity refer to space to, to, to from, from, uh, you know, from the framework of uh, the commercial entities, from the lesson learned from NASA, but uh, they, they, are, they might not be the same. So it's not the same language. They do not speak the same language. The selection of astronauts builds on medical standards, which are not criteria, because there is a, there is a medical doctor who interprets the medical history and decide and make decision about it. So it's not just a process black and white. 
And so that has to evolve, but it has to be flexible. In the future, uh, safety has to be more important than medical standards. Otherwise, we cannot guarantee the long-term collaboration between uh, commercial astronaut, former astronaut, astronaut with a disability, and any sort of things. And so the key here is enabling uh, the evolution of safety that embrace uh, safety itself, management and safety culture. But that has to be an international effort because right now there is no real a transfer of lesson learned between um, continents yeah. and from ground activities to space, because uh, any sort of things that people call analogs do not produce lesson learned the space agency can adopt straight away. And this is a huge limit because this is a, a waste of investment. This is one of the reasons which people do not want to invest in the ground, because you don't see the return okay, back from, from the first investment. So the more we found a way to close the gap between uh, what we can use, the facility and the resources that we have on the ground for enabling the space activity in space, then the better it's going to be because it's going to be an enabler, facilitator of, of the growth of, uh, of, the com of, the, of the space sector. And that would help finding customers. This is what we need. And this is a part, this is, this is something that I see, and is, I really hope it's gonna go to that direction. Great, thank you very much. I, we just received a sign that we should uh, wrap up the session. Albert, anyone who would like to say a few final words, or shall yeah, we? Yeah, I think that, well, we talked already about this, well, public customers and how we can build the new model. I think that Sava can, well, tell a lot about, well, or maybe a little bit, because this is the time is running up. So right. we, let's hope that is going to be a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm very interested in impact markets, and I think I hope that ultimately the government can get behind that. But then also, um, the private industry and and people in the end kind of want. We all kind of want the same thing. We all want to go into space. We all want to be healthy. We all want well-being. Um, and if we can put a price on that. Um, and, and create uh, a way of basically valuing that, um, I think we can really um, implement a lot of really interesting business models um, and particularly um, uh, uh, leveraging open source as well. Great. Thank you very much. Albert, the floor is yours to conclude the session. Uh, that's right. So, well, as I think that we covered all possible aspects and areas of the well space economy and, and the whole uh, deep, deep technology markets, I think that we see that there will be a lot of challenges and also a lot of opportunities for us to build our future, not for next 10 or 20 years, but for many centuries, in fact. So I think that, well, before us, there will be really interesting times and also challenging for all of us. And thank you for attending this panel and sharing with us well, your opinions, knowledge, and experience. Thank you very much.